welcome one and all to this fun competition Except nobody knows if there's any opposition Face so friendly, smile disarms, everything's good No cause for alarm, cause I'm like you And likewise the same, but for you this is work And for me it's a game, give a thumbs up if you know what I'm saying Next round starting, believe that I'm playing Introduction's not needed, been completed so to speak Since I always act familiar each and every time we meet We're not colleagues, you've never even heard of me But I'm just so polite and you're returning every courtesy We're a perfect team, racking up a perfect score huh? Always have my hands full, you always hold the door so nice. Gather info, you wouldn't take control at first Shoulder surf your photo surf so I can find your older work Brought a cool and small talk, conversation banter Really I'm just probing Okay, welcome to the social-engineer.org podcast number 35 Number 35 How you doing, Dave? What's up, guys? Nothing much, Jordan, how you doing? I'm good, man, I'm chilling Yep, yep, yeah, see, things are going good, you notice we're missing ping yeah, thanks Ping. for showing up, Ping. Yeah, she's a world traveler now, so she's too important for us. Ping. Yeah, you know. Did I lose you guys? Nah, man. Oh. I, uh, I'm i looking out the window because I live on Hollywood Boulevard, so occasionally I get distracted by Russian girls who don't know that it's inappropriate to have like half of their you-know-whats hanging out of their shorts. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, so you 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 should have your blinds closed while we're doing this podcast. I, I actually do have the blinds closed now. <laughs> because you know, obviously we're not going to get very far. I mean, I the, the I one like, intel- I close these. <laughs> you know the one intelligent panel member we have is not with us today. So, well, I'm here. <laughs> like I said. <laughs> what? Wait, what? what? I, don't, what? I don't get it. I don't what? get the joke. What? What's going on, Dave? What? Who? <laughs> You know, and and Ping, you know, I really wanted to know. Maybe you know the answer to this, Dave. How? Uh, and and I'm not joking. I'm not teasing you. I'm really curious. How's your class doing at Black Hat? I honestly um, don't know. I, Ping sent me some stuff a while ago, but I don't remember what it is offhand. But it seems to be doing pretty good. So you're getting all the signups. I am getting signups. I mean, I don't think I'm doing as good as you, but you know, I'm doing well. Well, I'm sold out. You know, so. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, mean, I was just wasn't gonna say, but you know, now that you mentioned it. You know. I mean, I sold out this whole month at the Art of Charm. <laughs> So if you guys want to measure you know what's then that's fine. Well, we yeah. really can't compete with you, okay? I mean, you know, our classes are like at a whole different level. You know, you're, the things you're teaching, there's probably just more people interested in, in general. Fair. I would say fair. That's a fair assessment. Um, since mostly most people don't even understand what it is that you are going to be teaching at these classes. Yeah, that's quite that, – that could be true. I th- I'm sure it is because, you know, I – I'm going to take your class in Vegas, and I don't really know what I'm going to learn. Is somebody playing music? Oh, that would be Dave. You know, he always ah. has Bruce Horns be going on. And some Good. Time, you know. Okay, I'm, I'm glad. You know, he likes to wreck the podcast. Um, we used to have like 200,000 listeners, and then the first time <laughs> he played Bruce Hornsby, we went down to like 1,000. You know? <laughs> you know, so <laughs> people were like, what's this? What we need to do is, is have this music going in sync the whole podcast, and it's just like a mellow background. just plays in repeatable whole, whole show. <laughs> Great. So the guy who's now driving, listening to our podcast, has fallen asleep and died. Well, listen, we just do something like this. Right? Like this. Keep going. Just keep going. Keep rolling with it. No, 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 no. No, you're wrecking it. I mean, our intro music it, is like dual core. It's it awesome. Sounds like, uh, it sounds like the iPhone ringer or that alarm, you know? It's like the acoustic guitar and it just keeps playing. Yeah. And whoever has that ringer, you're like, why would that person ever choose that ringer? That's the most annoying <laughs> one. It's this, the, actually, the most annoying one is that old car horn ringer. That's oh, the most annoying one. No, I actually was in um, a grocery store the other day, and this older woman, she had to be 60s, 70s, her phone rings, and it's the I'm sexy and I know it song. <laughs> and I was looking around like, wait, that's got to be like her granddaughter's phone or something. And no, she pulled out this iPhone that was like all blinged out. Uh, with, uh, don't you believe it? Oh, man. See, all right, ping, ping. I'm mad at you, ping. I want you to know if you listen to this podcast, I'm mad at you because usually you can keep Dave under control and you're not here. <sighs> Anyhow, let's talk about some things going on. The, okay, I'm sorry, go ahead. the social engineering CTF. It is went off the hook. Off the hook. I'm, I'm really, really excited. All the contestants, um, you know, they all committed 100%. Everything's 100% right now. The reports went out. The targets went out. The reports have been pouring in since last night. Uh, some really amazing talent this year in report writing. I'm kind of uh, impressed 
with what I've been seeing so far. Uh, what I'm not impressed with, um, which is not the contestants' fault, is just still how much information is out on the web and open source that these people are finding. It's really scary. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're seeing more of that. The reports are in this year. Our, we have our, our uh, sponsor for that I want to mention, Core. Core Security is uh, sponsoring the SECTF this year at DEF CON 20. So, of course, we want to thank them. You guys got to check them out at coresecurity.com. Uh, they're pretty awesome. Those guys over there are always supporting us and helping us out. What do they do? Core, well, core, the, probably the thing they're most known for is they make a product called Core Impact, which is like a penetration testing tool. It, um, it, it's made to test a, a network. Usually people who are running teams, like security teams within a company, will buy their product to test, um, test vulnerabilities that may be open on their network by running this tool against all of their servers and computers within their own network. And then it scans the servers for open ports, tests certain um, exploits against any software that it finds, and then reports back if the ports were vulnerable to any public exploits. And then the person can obviously go back and fix it. So, so it's like an automatic hacker bot suite <laughs> of software. Yes, yes. <laughs> automatic hacker bot. That, that, that should change their name to that. <laughs> yeah, HackerBot Enterprises sounds way cooler than, well, I don't know, Core sounds pretty cool. Yeah. Do they spell it with a K or anything no, like that? No, That'd no, be cool. no, Core right. with a C. You can tell that my era has passed in my hacker days, like in the 90s when you changed all the C's to K's and all the O's to zeros, and yeah. you you mixed upper and lower case typing. Yeah, 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 That's that, that stuff is um, not used so much anymore, at least not in the corporate world. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if, like, you know, their clients who are Fortune 1000 companies and bigger want to come to their website and see, like, Leet speak and then spend, like, yeah. tens of yeah. thousands of dollars on their product, you know? And, and the, the CEO is like, I don't understand what this guy's trying to say. And he's like, that's just because, sir, you are not K-Rad enough. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, so <laughs> when they run it, the report comes out and says, your network has been screwzed, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah, hacksword, yeah, all hack your all your, all your base are belong to us. Yes, yeah. Sorry. That's all the report says, you know. So, no, that, that terrible commercial for Core. They're going like, to pull their sponsorship now, <laughs> you know. They're like, yeah, pull the plug. We, yeah. uh, we're going to, we need our cash back, bro. Yeah, either you guys that, are tools. Either that or they'll change the report to be like, oh, your base belong to us, you know. <laughs> yeah, I think that's cool, man. In it fact, is. you know, whatever gets people talking about the company, you know, it's like the Old Spice commercial. That that you oh, know man. <laughs> the Old Spice guy he's that's crazy. He's not really talking about how good Old Spice is. He's just like you know what R riding a horse backwards while on the towel and on a horse. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. They're really ridiculous commercials. I agree. <clears throat> okay, so what else? There's the social engineering CTF for kids that also kicked off, and um, we're seeing some pretty good results so far because um, last year we didn't really see parents signing their kids up until maybe mid June. So we already have over a dozen uh, kids signed up for that. So it's expected to kind of pile in the next couple weeks, and then we'll see a lot more kids than last year. And we really expanded the CTF for the kids this year. Uh, we made the puzzles way harder. The, the ciphers are much more difficult. There's more of them, and there's multi-level attack vectors that they have to, they have to um, uh, figure out. So one cipher will lead to another. They'll have to put things together and figure the whole thing out as a whole, and then at the end, all the pieces fit together to give them their last clue. So it's going to be it's gonna be really cool. I don't want to give too much away on that. and Because um, there's a lot of kids listening to the show, of course. Well, you, you know, they're made, well, their parents probably <laughs> Come on. are listening. Come on. <laughs> Dave, totally. Dave kids listen to the show. No, they don't. Yeah, that's just, that's what Dave calls babysitting. He's like, hey, <laughs> sit down and listen to this and don't move for an hour and a half. You see, you see, and he's like, just, they're, they're, and they're, <laughs> they're like, daddy, no. And he's like, it's either that or horns me. Yeah. <laughs> and, they're like, and they're like, give me social engineer podcast. You know, yeah, I can see it. I can see it. The kids love it. Our, uh, our sponsor for the kids CTF is Qualys. Oh, that's a nice nice company. They've been supporting us for the last couple of years with the CTFs, and um, they one of the higher ups there his his kids actually took part in the CTF last year. So uh, hopefully they'll be signing up again this year. But the Qualys is helping us out with the sponsorship for that. Um, 
uh, they're, they're really supportive of what we're doing with the kids. So it's kind of nice to to see bigger companies coming out and saying, you know, that they're they're there to support the the efforts to to make these events really popular. And what do they do? It's a way to reach out to computer systems to see if you can find what exposures there might be out there that attackers may be able to to go after and, and, and hack the machine. But it's like so it's, it's like hardware. It's like a hardware box that does it instead of a software suite or something. Or uh, kind of. I mean, it's 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 software still. But I mean, you know, you're you're using it from their platform, so they use their hardware to go in and scan. And they, oh, okay. And they this do stuff have, is still over my head. And they do have a box that they can set. That they send certain clients. I remember. I, maybe they they don't. I should check if they do that. Still, but back in the day, they had a box that they send to their clients. You could put in your network. Uh, so you can do external scans like you were a, an internal machine. Um, oh, I see. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, because you know, then you, you can work remotely instead of flying over right. to their office and plugging something in. Right, and that works good for consultants. Yeah, uh, people who are consultants who uh, you know who want to use their product to help their clients because now they can offer these kind of services with just uh, installing this utility on your network, and you don't have to always have a guy fly into your office to do the work. Nice. Yeah. yeah, that's that's brilliant, actually. Yeah, so it's a it's a and they're they're a nice company, and the guys that I work with, at least the guys that I know, they've always been really easy to work with, and they're very supportive of the um, the kids events there in DEF CON, So it's kind of cool to see that too. That's yeah. awesome. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, let's see. There's somebody else I, I wanted to, uh, you know, that's why I gave you first dibs, Dave, to promote your class because there's another class I wanted to promote. We, yeah. Well, no, this is good. This is good. I, I, you know, we all love the guys at at Perturva. Uh, they make Maltigo, and uh, Maltigo is probably my favorite, favorite, favorite tool in the whole world. And you can't get better than those guys at Perturva. I'm not sure if they're gonna like the commercial being for, um, you know, with Bruce Hornsby as the theme music, but we'll see what they say. Maltigo. Oh, sorry. I was gonna start singing. Um, so they have a class, Digital Intelligence Gathering, using Maltigo. Now, last year, their, 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 um, their course, from what I heard, at least from the, I, I knew a few people that took it, they said it was just really sick, you know, that they had these, these guys, um, that came in the class, they set up, like, all these different little machines with Maltigo, and then they, they took you to the deepest parts of Maltigo. I mean, not the stuff that, you know, you see just on the web, or the stuff that we all know that you download Maltigo, you play a little bit. But they have some brand new features coming out, a lot of new uh, transforms and scripts in Maltigo. And, of course, it's the class is taught by the guys who make the tool. So if you want to know the deepest stuff about Maltigo, uh, then you got to sign up for this class. And, you know, I love promoting Maltigo because I use their tool. We use it in our class. I, I mean, I just I love them. So they, um, <clears throat> I was asking them you know, what they're giving away in their class because everyone's got some things that they give to their students and stuff. So if you're interested in taking that, you can go to the blackhat.com site, look for Digital Intelligence Gathering using Maltigo. I think everyone in the class is getting a full case file license, which is like Maltigo, but without the scripts that you can use it for mapping out networks and kind of making um, um, graphical representations of the targets that you're looking at. And and I think this year they're given like a 75-day license of the Maltigo Pro, which is ridiculous to me because, you know, normally you get like 30 days or just while you're in the class, but it's like over two months worth of that. And then they got some coupons that they're giving out for like like discounts on the um, on the client license for anyone who's in the class. And um, they got some cool swag for guys in the class. And of course, I think this is the best one. If you sign up for their class and you mention that you heard about it on the social-engineer.org site... They're giving you a free Red Bull. I mean, come on. Nice. I mean, and nice. I, I, you know, I have this image of, of basically all you guys kind of living on Red Bull. Yeah, I have an IV right now that <laughs> just has Red Bull, and it just usually follows me around the house, this bag that I have hanging. You know, and it it's just... not carbonated, though. That would be bad for you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I usually flatten it a little bit. But sometimes a bubble here or there is nice. You know, it gives me a little wake-up call and the old ticker. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! At AOC, we've got a monster fridge here in the actual training facility, and it's funny because guys come in and they're like, "Oh man, energy drinks? Yeah, I don't do that." And by the end, they're like, "Hey, we're out of we're out of the orange one." So they go down to CVS and they come back with like an eight pack of orange, <laughs> and we have like we're like, "These are free, man! It's sponsored." And they're like, "I just want I gotta have the orange one. I gotta have the orange one." <laughs> I love Monster. 
I do. I love. I can't, I can't drink that stuff, man. I mean, I, I I stay away from any of those energy drink stuff. They're so bad for you. Yeah, I, I like the ones. I like the sugar free one. Believe it or not, because then when you come down, you don't come down off this like twelve thousand grams of sugar. Right, you just come down off of aspartame, taurine, caffeine, and ginseng. Yeah, yeah, basically. Which is totally way better for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, and usually I, I <laughs> usually I down a couple ephedra pills, um, and I use the monster to, to walk. Wait, them down. wait, wait, wait! How did you how did you pronounce that? Ephedra. <laughs> ephedra. Uh huh. Huh. Well, how do you kinda say? Like, is that kind of like ephedra? Yeah. yeah. Is it ephedra at all? Yeah, just like it, except yeah. except better. Would you would you say it was? Yeah. Ephedra. <laughs> I take some ephedra. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you always got to find something to damage me. What would you do? You? Ephedra? I mean, for ser- seriously. Like, uh, did you grow up in a hole? <laughs> <laughs> I did, as a matter of fact. I did. I mean, you see, like, like every news agency reporting that ephedrine and uh, ephedra. Uh, causes major issues in your body and, you know, ephedra, 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 ephrogen. Yeah, I hear that stuff all the time, but, you know, the FDA still allows them to sell it, so it must be safe. They do not! <laughs> it's also banned by the FDA. Oh, it's, well, it's, you know, okay, so I buy it from Russia. I mean, whatever, <laughs> I, you know. But the, you, you, oh, so you buy ephedra from, from Russia, not so, ephedra. I got it. So, so you know, the, the <laughs> Russian FDA lets them sell it, so it must be safe. <laughs> I read on the internet that it is good for you. <laughs> oh, yeah. man. You know, Ping, when you're not here, do you just see how things go? Yeah, do you see exactly. What, do you see what you did to us, Ping, by not being here? I hope you're ashamed. <laughs> <laughs> like, we're not going to talk about anything social engineering. We're just going to sit there and rag on each other. Right, yeah. right. <laughs> Great. This will be the worst podcast ever. <laughs> what's, which, what's next... Oh, um, uh, Diggy, I want to talk about Diggy. You know, I like like a couple times I promoted Digi P. I know everyone has says his name different. Tom, we all use the guy for web stuff. Well, I shouldn't say all. Not everybody on Earth, but I mean, he's a he's a good web guy. And uh, I had a I had his website up on uh, one podcast notes, and then for some reason I just forgot to put him in the notes the last few times. So I want to just mention him that if you're looking for any kind of web work, you can check him out. Um, I'll have the link for for Digi on, in the in the podcast notes, so you can just go to any of my site or Dave's sites, and the, you know he does them. So you can look at the bottom. There's a link to his site down there, so you can check out check out that stuff. Also, Dual Core. Um, if you like the intro music, you need to check him out. DualCoreMusic.com. So you can check him, check out his songs there. He wrote the podcast song just for us. The intro, what you hear in the intro and outro. Uh, that song's called Control. And uh, I think he has it on the website for nothing now. I know I said that last time and it wasn't there. And then we emailed him and they put it up there now. So, uh, and I think he's uh, he's out playing at DEF CON. He's definitely playing at Derby this year, right, Dave? He is, for sure. Absolutely. So, um, if you want to see Dual Core, you can check him out at any of the cons. He's usually hanging around. He's actually helping me out, too, with the kids CTF. He's going to be a target for the kids um, at, at the at the. DEFCON 20 SECTF for kids, so that's going to be kind of fun. See how he gets to play his role out there. Okay, what else do we have? Anything else we got to talk about or or promote before we move on to actual guest interviews? No? Okay. Well, I mean, you know. <laughs> that, yes, that, that should definitely be promoted. Um, I've got to... The Art of Charm has an online academy where you can learn a bunch of fundamentals of like body language, vocal tonality, eye contact, setting up good good dates or interactions, you know, working on a lot of your interpersonal skills, things like that. And a lot of I know a lot of the guys are married, they're like, I don't need that. But we have a lot of married guys take the class. This is our online university, and this month we're offering it for a dollar for the first month. So go to the Art of Charm dot com slash academy and you can try it for a dollar. See all those guys who are like, Oh, I don't know can stop whining and try it because it's 99 cents and if you don't like it i'll give you your dollar back and then shortly after they take the class they commit adultery no just kidding <laughs> <laughs> have, have you seen that post up there this is actually somewhat relevant there's a there's a post that came out yesterday it went crazy viral uh all over the place and this guy got on a plane and sat next to a model 
and he starts chatting her up. And it turns out he's some D-bag actor from Hollywood, big surprise. And she had paid, you know, the nine ninety five or whatever to have internet during the flight. So she's live tweeting this dude who she sees has a wedding ring and is totally married. She's live tweeting his entire sort of uh, attempt at getting her digits and, like, picking her up on this aircraft. And it's awful. And someone's like, wait, is this him? And shows, like his IMDb profile with his photograph in it. And she's like, yeah, that's him. So everyone knows who this guy is. His first and last name are on there. She's like, he's just really wasted now. And they're like, oh, here's a link talking about how he's a sober guy who like had this awakening uh, and went to AA. So she just ruined this dude's entire life oh in like an hour and a half. Oh, that's kind of terrible. It's kind of terrible, but also it's like, the dude definitely was trying to cheat on his wife and came back from the bathroom with the ring off and was like, oh, no, it's just uh, some ring I like. You know, I'm not married. Oh, well, then he definitely deserves it. Yeah, yeah. His his IMDb <clears throat> profile has, like, his wife and kid mentioned in it, and he's like, oh, no, I'm single, blah, blah, blah. So the dude's a scumbag. Big time. Big yeah. time bag. Yeah, that, he, well. he got so called out. So it just goes to show, like, just because you're on the airplane doesn't mean – you're not getting your your stuff live tweeted to the world in real time. <laughs> Nowadays, yeah, the internet yeah, on the planes. Well, amazing. good. I guess I don't feel bad for him anymore. No, no. <laughs> and again, nothing to do with social engineering, but very interesting story. Security, though, right? I mean, it's like you think, <laughs> oh, well, I can do whatever I want. How could this possibly bite me in the butt? Oh, this girl who has 13,000 Twitter followers is actually somewhat well-known and actually shelled out to have internet on her phone during this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very interesting. Um. Okay. Well, we'll we'll do uh, we'll do the derby promo at the end. How about that, Dave? He's he's muted and doesn't know. <laughs> No, no, I'm just ignoring Chris. It's just one okay. <laughs> so, so we're so actually we're not going to do derby promo at all now. Okay, uh, guys, okay, so I'm gonna hang up now. See you later. Derby's been canceled, by the way. <laughs> he actually hung up. <laughs> oh yeah, I saw that. Yeah, he's gone. That's great. He's now gone. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I tell you, Ping, Ping. I hope if you listen to this that you're just crying. I hope you cry. Realize, Ping, Ping, you realize this is all your fault. Yeah, I hope. I hope when you hear this, Ping, that you cry. We all fall apart when this happens. Like yeah. Mutz was the one that used to like hold us together. Yeah. And then and then, and then that you know that left, and Ping was the, the authoritative figure to take care of us kids. And then it just when Ping's not here, it just goes away. Yeah, I mean, this is just terrible. It really is. Anyhow, let's talk about our guest. Our guest is John Nolan. Now, John Nolan is I got an interesting story. Um, like a lot of our guests that were in the in some kind of um, in the security field. Now he's got a military background. He was a U.S. Army officer. Uh, he worked with special forces. He was an intelligence officer for special forces. Uh, he his career in the military usually centered on things like intelligence collection, counterintelligence, and special operations. Um, after he uh, exited the military, he worked. Um, he owned a company. Actually, created a company that did just that. Those same types of things. He trained. Uh, law enforcement and other people on uh, uh, using a consulting firm that he started on how to do like oh, information gathering, um, use elicitation professionally. Um, the company really grew. He had a lot of lot of success with that. He sold it, uh, I believe, just a few years ago, like down in 2010 or something to that effect. And now he's now he still works as a consultant with the government on these things. He wrote, I think it's eight books. We'll ask him when he comes on. But probably the most popular is a book that's called Confidential, Business Secrets, Getting Theirs, Keeping Yours. Now, why is this so popular? I don't, I don't really understand uh, why it went out of print, but it, yeah. went, it went out of print after it got sold. I mean, it got a lot of press. It looks like a how-to on committing corporate espionage, you know, <laughs> um, yeah. even though that's not what, you know, what he intended it to be. Um, uh, you know, I, I had the same kind of reactions to my book when it came out, so I understand that. Um, but now if you go to Amazon and you look for this book, John Nolan and uh, Confidential is the name of the book. It's like there's one on there for $500 because it's out of print, and then there's a bunch of used ones that usually are 50 to $70. Bucks. Um, so at the end, we got a special announcement about the book, but um, really interesting book if you have a copy. 
If you don't, we'll see what we can do about that. But that's what's, the, what's the special I, announcement? I said at the end. I know, but what is it right now? But I want to tell you at the end. But I want to know right now. I will. Okay, but but. I mean, that you know, half, 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 half your audience. I mean, half your audience thinks that's Tupac. Just so you know. <laughs> I guess that's a good point. They really do. <laughs> I actually said it um, while you were playing that music. You just didn't hear the special announcement because the music was too loud. <laughs> so I'm sorry that you missed out on that. Okay, so we're going to get John on the call now. We have our guest on, John Nolan. John, thanks uh, for coming on. I appreciate you being with us today on the podcast. My pleasure. My pleasure indeed. So um, as we were talking a little bit we were talking about you. <laughs> that doesn't sound too great, but we were talking about you and your book uh, before. And, and, and reading some of your bio, um, how many books have you written? I saw there was eight books. Yeah, uh, those others have been for different populations in different topical areas. Uh, country study of a remote country in the middle of the Pacific, those kinds of things. So they don't really relate to this particular topic. So the book that we have um, is called Confidential, Business Secrets, Getting Theirs, Keeping Yours. And um, a very fascinating topic, by the way, and, and for us and what we do, um, especially on this podcast, it's a very interesting because solicitation, of course, is one of the skills that we analyze and study all the time as social engineers, not only because as security professionals we need to be able to use it effectively, but it's one of the many tools that malicious hackers or social engineers will try to use against us or our customers to gather information and then use that to damage the, the companies. So it, se it seems like uh, your book is just is a, is a wonderful guide on, on how to recognize and utilize elicitation. Um, but did you get a lot of, I just, this is kind of like an off-the-cuff question, did you get a lot of slack maybe from the book like it's a how-to on corporate espionage or did people um, get upset when you printed this kind of a book no uh, as a matter of fact uh, the exact opposite uh, most of the people who have responded over the years have indicated that um, you know it, it's a good insomnia cure as uh, we just discussed <laughs> uh, but uh, but also uh, it tends to codify things that people have kind of known intuitively and had stumbled into on their own from time to time. But as we uh, develop and work through which techniques uh, are available, which ones are efficient, which ones are effective, and particularly the extent to which they can be used uh, by a certain personality type against another personality type, uh, causes them to think, yeah, I sort of do that, or gosh, I've never thought of doing that. And that allows them the opportunity to make it a lot uh, more efficient uh, when, they are, um, when they are collecting information irrespective of whether it's in a business intelligence context or whether it's uh, being a hiring manager in our increasingly litigious society where if you don't get the job, you sue somebody because they asked you the wrong question. Well, Obviously, if it's solicitation, you're not asking questions. You're obtaining that information without asking questions. Uh, lawyers who are so accustomed to asking questions uh, suddenly realize that there are a lot of places like depositions and voir dire and places like that where they can actually get away without asking questions and being admonished, uh, admonished by the judge uh, over the opposing counsel's objection, those kinds of things. So there's a, a wide range of people. Uh, it, obviously was written initially for the business intelligence uh, community and for the business counterintelligence community, guys doing what it was that you're doing to help uh, alert their people to the ways that people try and gather information from them. But it's, uh, it's, been, uh, it's been useful for many different populations to include the psychiatrists and psychologists. It never ceases to amaze me. Uh, when you get uh, a psychologist who calls and says, you know, I just got finished reading your book, and I never really realized how difficult it was for a child who's been sexually molested to answer direct questions. But when I phrase those questions in statements that are more elicitation-oriented, I get a lot more out of them because it's not as challenging or threatening to them. So most of your clients are psychologists then? 
No, 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 no. I'm just saying that, that this is a rather broad spectrum, all the way from psychologists and psychiatrists to uh, to business intelligence people to law enforcement people to uh, intelligence officers uh, in the government and out of the government, uh, people in the sales domains, uh, counselors, uh, you name it. Uh, just about okay. anybody who, who has to rely upon human interaction gets stuff out of the first third of the book. And in the book, you identified um, what I can pick out as being like 12 different types of elicitation techniques. Out of the 12 elicitation techniques, which one do you think is the most popular for a bad guy, let's say, a malicious person to use against someone else? Well, I, I would uh, hesitate to try and quantify the use of one over another because one of the things that it's important to bear in mind is that not all techniques work with all people. For example, there are some techniques that work wonderfully well with an extrovert but don't work well with an introvert at all. In our society, of course, a much more extroverted society, uh, a quid pro quo where somebody feels a necessary challenge to show how much better they are than the guy who started talking, uh, you know, doing one-upsmanship or one-downsmanship. In our society, that would be very, uh, very much more popular and much more effective if you're talking to Koreans, or even if you're talking to Brits, uh, they may be far less uh, interested in uh, being as open and effusive as Americans. So you might wish to change uh, the approach that you would use with an extrovert to a different approach that you would use with an introvert. Uh, for example, if it's an accountant who's an introvert, uh, with a pencil neck and uh, you know, a tie and a short sleeve white shirt and a pocket protector, uh, you can almost begin to imagine that he's really interested in other things. You can flatter him, and that probably isn't going to work. You might offer him uh, uh, something that he is likely to want to correct, and he will be much more responsive to that because it's somebody, an architect, an engineer, an accountant, who lives in a world of precision and accuracy is more likely to give you a corrected statement uh, than when in response to your purposely erroneous statement. Uh, so it would be difficult to quantify which technique is the most favorite, um, and it would be also uh, presumptuous of me to suggest that only the 12 techniques that are listed in that one section of the book are the only techniques that are employed. Uh, we use a wide range of techniques. Those just seem to be the tip of the iceberg and the most easily managed, most easily understood by most people. That's why we put those in. Yeah, it seems like your um, your thought process on that is very similar to ours. I mean, we we teach the same the same type of methods. Is that you know not there's not like one one uh, one size fits all. Um, the kind of uh, philosophy when it comes to this stuff because each person is different. Uh, I should have started off with this actually to ask you because a lot of our listeners may may not even um, realize that the exact topic that we're talking about. But maybe you could tell us how do you define elicitation? Uh, elicitation is getting the information you want um, without asking questions. That's the simplest way of uh, defining it. Uh, mechanically and procedurally, however, it becomes more complex because most of us, particularly Americans, seem to think that there's something, um, how shall I say it, uh, unsavory about planning a conversation. Most Americans tend not to plan conversations. Most tend not to set an outcome unless people accuse you of, oh, he's always got an agenda. You know, that kind of an attitude. And so there's a, uh, there's a reluctance on the part of many people to do anything other than just have a conversation on the fly and not appear in their, to, the, to themselves, let alone to anybody else, uh, to have planned a conversation. So when we talk about which technique, we might talk about five or six different techniques that we plan on using with a particular individual, and especially if we have multiple contacts with that individual. We'll have learned 
over the first conversation which ones work with a guy and which ones won't. And then that way you don't have to bother wasting your time um, using those techniques in different order not to get different kinds of information from a source of information. But maybe um, you can give us an example because I guess a lot of people, and, and this happened to me too when I first started studying this topic, uh, exactly how you define it. I, I love it because it's very simple, but it was very clear. You know, getting information from someone without asking questions. So h- how do you do that? I mean, how do you uh, start a conversation with a with uh, you know a, a person who will view you as a complete stranger? Um, you know, you have your target and objective in mind, and be able to obtain information from them without coming out and just asking, "I need to get this piece of information. Can you give it to me?" Well, that's certainly a direct. American approach, and it is tremendously off-putting any place else you go in the world. <laughs> I, I would say that uh, at the very outset. Uh, secondly, I would invite you to consider what happens when you ask somebody a question. What a question does is it provokes other questions in the, uh, in the other person's mind. Who is this guy? Why does he want this information? What's he going to do with this information? Is this going to benefit me? Is this going to injure me? Is this going to benefit my company? Is it going to uh, to be to my company's disadvantage? Uh, will I get in trouble if I say this? Will I get uh, a hero badge for saying this? And what that does is it distracts and uh, dilutes, the, uh, di- uh, distracts the person away from the real essence of what you want to talk about, and secondly, it tends to dilute the value of the information that they're willing to give you, as long as they're continuing to question who and what you are. So, the the mechanism that we find to be most useful is to start off with a pretty generalized question, that is to say, something that is not germane to the topic that you want to ultimately explore. Um, but rather to, uh, to gain that person's uh, response to a generalized question. I don't mean, uh, what do you think of the weather today? I mean, it might be something that is related to the economy or something that is related to politics or something that's related to uh, current events of some character. So generally uh, it's bad to like, ask a, a yes or no question because the, obviously you're not, you're not getting more of a response. So you're saying your suggestion is that when we start the conversation, we ask something not related to our actual target goal, but you know sure. we're we're in Starbucks or whatever getting a coffee and there's a a, a paper uh, next to him talks about some major drop in the stock market you know right. uh, maybe some open ended question like oh man I, I don't know about you but every time i see these things in the stock market they they just scare the living heck out of me you know how how's the economy affecting your work or something like that is that a well that's that's the common thing how's the economy affecting your work what you've just done is asked a question. Why does he want to know how it's affecting my work? Okay, right up to that point, it was great. Okay, and leaving that alone before you got to that question that you just asked, how's it affecting you and your work? If you had left it at the previous point, that allows the other guy to say, oh, yeah, you, uh, you can't imagine uh, my wife is is a day trader, and she's just crazy all the time because of the fluctuations. I mean, what you want that guy to do is respond to your statement as opposed to responding to your question. So now you say, day trading. Uh, I've heard some stuff about that, but I'm not sure I understand what, what somebody does when they're doing day trading. I mean, this is you may very well know a lot about day trading, but if you are... Uh, uh, unwilling to suspend your ego long enough to recognize that your object is to get information about that guy's wife's day trading, as an example, um, then you're going to say, oh, I already know all about day trading. Oh, yeah, that's a stupid thing. Your wife is probably losing more money than you know what to do with. Uh, You know, if you say something that is uh, self-effacing or humble or naive, uh, which is not something that a lot of people master immediately, uh, you're going to get that other person to be, become more expansive. If you're going to perceive that that person, for example, were a professor, a college professor, what does he or she do for a living? 
they lecture, they teach, they inspire, they bore sometimes, uh, and yet, what is it that they are? They're a dispenser of knowledge, and if you position yourself as somebody who doesn't know very much about their area of expertise or something with which they're associated, they're probably going to fall quickly into the lecturer mode and be unable to resist the lecturer's temptation. So let's use my my bad example because I actually like that. I like I like this way, and I think our listeners enjoy this type of education too. Um, and let's fix it. So I, I like I liked what you said. So my goal in this meeting is to get information on his wife's day trading. Now I see the yeah. paper. I see some story about the economy. Uh, where right. I messed up is asking an exact question. So how right. how would I approach that? You know, I start. Oh man, the, I read these newspapers. The economy, holy macro, just makes me depressed. Is that it? Do I just stop there and like I threw the softball up and I see if he responds? Yeah, or you could be talking to somebody else. If, say, for example, you've observed this guy for a few minutes beforehand, and he's shucking and jiving with everybody else, he's probably not the laid-back introverted type. Okay, the laid-back introverted type is probably not going to respond to your provocative statement, right? But the, if he's an extrovert, he probably is going to throw his two cents worth in. So the more provocative the statement can be, the more uh, you can expect that he's going to jump in. You might not even be talking directly to him. So this comes into the into the skill set of people watching that most of you already understand. But you do people watching for giggles. We do people watching to identify what personality attributes we can detect by their overt behaviors and so, then shape our selection of techniques appropriately. So let's go with that. Let's say, yeah, let's say he's an extrovert. Like I like your your scenario. So he's you know he's chatting up with a couple of people around him. He doesn't seem to be just in his own world. Would it be right. would it be a bad principle then? Um, when I see the newspaper article to make a negative comment, something like, oh, man, this economy's killing me. It's probably all these stinking day traders. They don't know what they're doing, and they're killing the stock market. Is that a, is that a bad elicitation technique, like I'm doing he, – like he's going to have to be called to defense because his wife is a day trader? That That's a way of approaching it. I don't know that I would be as upfront about day trading because that's kind of a niche area. I would I – would, start off imagining that this is a conversation that's shaped like an hourglass so that I might get to day trading after five or six exchanges with mm -hmm. this guy. Excellent. The very first thing that I'd be talking about would be the, the general state of the economy and what kind of an impact it's having on the market and the, uh, what's impacting your 401k, uh, what has happened to your mother or your father's investments. You know, becoming a human being and, and humanizing the conversation so that it doesn't sound like it's a, a pure intrusive deal. I mean, you're giving something, right? So if you say, my father and my mother, they sit around and they clip coupons now, but uh, man, it's just getting to be a, a horror show for people on fixed incomes and, uh, and minimal uh, amounts of investment. You know, this gives an opportunity for you to say, it's not me, so that you don't have to be uh, talking about how it impacts you, you can be saying it's my mom and my dad, and uh -huh. I just listen to the things that they're saying. Yeah, that so third-party you know, reference. If you really don't know much about it, you can say something stupid and not come across as being uh, uh, being phony. Yeah, so that that third-party reference is powerful. But now, let, yeah, let's, oh, absolutely. Let, let's say that um, we were doing that, and he doesn't respond. Right, so we we throw the softball yep. up in the air. Maybe the girl behind right. the counter or somebody else says something, uh, but right. he doesn't actually respond to that. Now, now our goal is still, you know, getting information on his wife's day trading sure. practice. So, right. what's the next stage? How do we take this now elicitation scenario to the next stage to get him to respond? In that case, I would probably point him out to the girl behind the counter if it's a barista. Right? Isn't that what they call them? Yeah, I, 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 don't, I think so. I don't use Starbucks <laughs> much. Uh, so he's talking to the barista, and he's trying to get this uh, this other guy engaged. Uh, she may say one thing that, you know, and, and you've got to be prepared to do this, of course, uh, and say, well, that's an interesting observation, but I don't know that I agree with it. What do you think, okay, to that guy, to draw him into the conversation? Uh-huh. 
what do you think about what she just said? Not what I, what do you think about what I just said or how is this impacting you? But is that right? I, I don't know very much about this stuff. Do you know anything about this? Uh, is, so is the that? third party reference again takes you out of the equation. Exactly. And then you become the orchestra leader. Beautiful. Okay, and yeah. And then I think it becomes a conversation that they are in, and then you're saying, okay, now's your time to speak, now's your time to speak, that kind of thing. And then guide the conversation with other techniques. That's that, you know, yeah. Using naivete or, That's powerful. you know, a quid pro quo or a confusion or a flattery or something like that. You know, I might even say, okay, I, I think I understand, but this guy over here, the one with the three piece suit and the, uh, the watch uh, fob and uh, the watch chain and the five beta kappa pin, I'm sure that he's got well above the room temperature IQ that I've got. I'll bet. He is the guy that we should really be talking to about this. <laughs> I love. So, I mean, it. you're doing a spider to the fly kind of a thing. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Now, now let's 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 make another twist in this because what we did is we assumed that this guy was an extrovert. Um, yeah. Which you know I could see that scenario because I'm more extroverted, so I could see how that would actually be easier. But let's say sure. he's not. Let's say he's an introvert. Let's say when we watched well, him. Is an introvert. Yeah, when we, when, yep, when right. we did our people watching scenario, we see that mm -hmm. he really kind of kept to himself. He's off in a corner of the coffee shop reading his paper, not really interacting with anybody. Um, how are we going to establish some kind of um, conversation or elicitation with him that will engage him enough to interact with us? That becomes a little bit more dicey as a proposition uh, because he is probably going to... Uh, if he's sitting there by himself, you know, are you going to walk over and you're going to ask him if you can sit down at the same table with him? Well, that's okay if it's a crowded Starbucks. If he's the only guy in the corner and he's the only guy <laughs> yeah. in, the, in the shop. Yeah. Uh, do you mind if I share this? Share yeah, a little table? weird. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm a little bit on the weird side. Yeah, a little, yeah, bit, a little bit on the weird side. There's 30 other chairs, but you want to sit with him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, e exactly. So, I mean, you know, that's, that's a piece of the, that's a piece of the action. Uh, it would, it would be useful to assess him in terms of what he's doing. If he's sitting there and just daydreaming, you know, looking out at the traffic going by, that's one thing. If, on the other hand, he's doing something that suggests that he's intellectually curious, if he's doing, if he's reading a paper, if he's reading a book, or what kind of a book is it? Um, you know, those are the kinds of things that would really intrigue me. If his briefcase uh, had a luggage tag on it, uh, I would uh, I would probably comment about uh, something of that character. You know, mm -hmm. it might be a Delta Diamond tag uh, on that, just to be able to draw him into the conversation. Yeah, it, it it may very well be that he's sitting in the corner because he's got body odor, and everybody else has moved away from him. In which case, you know, your your other skills have to uh, to, to come into play. Uh, what I'm simply suggesting is that with an introvert, you probably need to find a definitive reason to interrupt his life because the introvert doesn't want unscheduled interruptions in his life. How, how do you feel uh, about um, like a um, coffee on him? No, no, definitely not. That. <laughs> I'm thinking of something more like, um, you, you know, you, you kind of walk to the table behind him and you act yeah. like, oh, what's this? And then you bend over and you pick a, a, you have a dollar in your hand, but you act like you picked it up off the floor and yeah. you come over to him and say, well, is this yours? This was sitting behind your chair right. on the floor. You know, it's only a dollar. So even if he takes it, you haven't lost anything, but right. it initiates a conversation with a third party reference of being a dollar. Indeed. You, you, you uh, I don't have any a, difficulty doing those yeah. artificial things at all. Okay. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I have very often uh, sat next near someone uh, and talked on the phone to an imaginary uh -huh. uh, uh, third party. And the things that I'm saying to him, to that imaginary third party, uh, I can gauge by looking at his face. If he looks up, and he starts looking or paying attention to what it is that I'm talking about, uh, then I know that when my conversation ends, uh, I can put the phone down and just, uh, you know, be muttering to myself. And very often, that guy will have already gotten drawn into the conversation. It may have been just a five-minute conversation. It could be one that is uh, loaded emotionally maiden, 
Uh, it could be uh, something very technical. It could be something that, uh, you know, is uh, uh, defining his politics. You know, what he's reading may tell you what his politics are. This is an ideal time to talk about politics or economics. How do you feel about something like, um, even like a very mild reference, something like, let's say you do your phone call. I like that. That's a really nice um, tactic, right? Because that third-party reference, people can overhear you, but, you know, mm-hmm. you're you're still in your own little conversation. And then Indeed. you're acting like, you know, I got to go get a gift for my son for his birthday after this phone call. And you're really mm-hmm. terrible at buying gifts. Uh, you never do a good job. And then when you hang up, you're kind of looking around and he's sitting there and actually asking him, you know, I, I, right. I just I stink at this. And my wife wants me to go pick up a gift at the store. Yeah. I, you have any kids? I mean, do you, do you know, you know, do you, what do you do when it's when it's your son's birthday time? Is that a yeah. a dead end? Is that a uh, like a potential disaster area? No, it's a good place, especially if you key it to what it is that he's reading. You know, if uh, if you if you say, "Oh, honey, I don't have time." You know, I get into a bookstore, and the next thing I know, I'm going out of there with two thousand dollars worth of books, and I haven't bought the one that you wanted me to buy. I'm not sure. You know, your brother-in-law is. He's a lot smarter than I am. You know, all he all he reads is 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 politics and economics and history and stuff. You know, my stuff. You know, is all fiction. I I, don't, I wouldn't know what kind of thing to buy. You know, and he's reading you know a, a history book. The, the guy that you're, is your target, yeah. and you're talking to your wife. You know, the okay. chances of him saying you know just pointing at his book, characteristic of a helpful American, which very often. Trump's introversion or extroversion. Yeah, probably by the time you approach him, you already know uh, more about him. So you know if he has children, you know what his marital yeah. status is. So when you right. when you're coming up with the you know quote unquote fake conversation, the the perceived right. uh, question, you already know if he's got a son. So you know asking mm-hmm. the question, do you have kids? You know it's it's kind of a um, a planted conversation to an extent. Yeah, so you don't need to ask him about whether he's got kids. You've already brought up kids in your faux conversation, right? Yeah. Or he's got a brother. He's obviously got a brother-in-law. He's got a father-in-law. If he's got a wedding ring on, he's got an in-law somewhere. <laughs> uh, and, you know, the wife, your wife on your phone call uh, could be just like his wife, uh, having in-laws that she needs to get presents for as well. You know, and you can portray yourself as being unaware of many different things. And the older I get, the more I find I'm unaware of uh, more and more uh, useful things. Today's useful technological things, if you will. Now, if this is a guy who's younger than me, by 30 or 40 years or 50 years even, <laughs> that still makes him, that still makes him uh, technologically adept in areas that I'm not. And if I have a problem with my phone, if I have a problem with my laptop, if I have a problem with anything, uh, dang it, I'll go, I, damn, I wish I could make this work. Yep. <laughs> yep. I uh, understand. I understand. I, you know, my, my kids, uh, as technically, as technical as I am, my, my kids seem yep. to always know more uh, about Absolutely. computers and they quick, they pick it up quicker. Younger ages, they're, they're now picking up this technology a lot faster. Oh, indeed. And they're more than willing to meet in to fix something. Partly because they want to show how clever they are, but two, you know, here's an old fat person who is, uh, I'm talking about myself, uh, we just can't I get think it you right. Got, I think you nailed Chris, too. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Real nice, Jordan. Real nice. You see why I keep these guys here? You see why? No. Oh, yeah. Comic relief is really valuable. Yeah, comic. Yeah, real comic. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, when I was talking earlier about the people watching thing, though, uh, I think that that's really an important piece because it ties directly into testing your skills. Many people think, you know, hey, well, I just read this book, so now I can do this. Well, this is a practice. You know, in our, as I alluded to earlier, our culture, the American culture, is one where we're very, very direct and we have no hesitancy in most cases about asking direct questions. And sometimes we get good responses and sometimes we don't. But my suggestion 
for anybody who's serious about this is to practice things in totally uh, benign environments. Yeah, I uh, agree. That is to say, uh, being in an airport and looking across and watching this guy for uh, 20 minutes and then figuring he's, uh, you know, uh, 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 the privileged son of an oil magnate from Texas. And I don't know whether he is or not, but he's got boots and he's got a pie plate belt buckle and, you know, he's, he, he's got a bunch of observables and he's acting in certain ways. Well, after I've reached my conclusions about all of the aspects of his life, oh, is he a college graduate? No, he probably got thrown out of a military school, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, then go up to him and engage him in conversation and use the elicitation techniques to elicit the information that either validates or invalidates your conclusion and what it will cause you to do is become much better at those hallucinations uh, that you accumulate about a person before you ever actually start talking to them so that you've got more confidence uh, when you actually do go up and talk to somebody for real. So besides the obvious things, you know, like like like, like an extrovert, you know, talking to other people, an introvert sitting in the corner, what kind of things do you look for to indicate, like, what type of personality you may be approaching? I look for somebody's fastidiousness. If they're neat and clean, uh, thin, well-groomed, or slovenly, uh, heavily tattooed, you know, I mean, I'm, I'll make a comment about somebody's tattoos in the New York Minute. You know, the day before yesterday I saw a guy, and I said, what's wrong with that patch right there above your right elbow? And he said, what do you mean? And I said, well, there's no tattoo there. It's about two inches square, and there's no tattoo there. What, what happened there? <laughs> and he looked at me like I had three heads, and then all of a sudden he started laughing. He said, yeah, I guess I'm going to have to do something about that. Uh and the, the, the tat my hallucination about this guy was that he had a kind of a mixed life uh, to include sometimes a guest of a county or a state uh, because <laughs> some of the tattoos were clearly prison tats. And I decided, you know, that's what this guy was. He was probably a common, you know, more or less common laborer kind of a guy. Uh, you know, it turned out that he was a welder, and then, indeed, he had some opportunities to be a guest of the state of Mississippi. Uh <laughs> The, the, the point here is that this is always an opportunity to practice things, even if it's nothing germane to your business, because the more you practice these things and the more you say, I think that I'm going to be trying to be naive today, because in our society, we're, uh, we're valued by how much we know, how sophisticated we are, right? If you come across as being a dope or get something wrong, whatever, then uh, you are devalued. You know, if you're uh, if you're a governor of a state and you want to abolish three federal agencies and you can't remember the third one when you're on national television in a debate, boom, that kind of ends your political career, <laughs> right? I mean, that's that's the way that we as Americans value people. You know, people can't make mistakes. Well. You know, if you purposely go out and make mistakes or say things that are wrong, that's not something that we do naturally in the United States. The point here is that our individual and collective cultural experiences create certain expectations of ourselves that if we can suspend those expectations, we can be different people according to different circumstances. And that takes practice. It isn't something that just happens as a result of reading about this technique or about this story or whatever. Most of us uh, read something for its entertainment value. Uh, most of us watch TV shows for, its, for their entertainment value. Um, I, I love a particular movie. It's called Dirty Rotten Scoundrels with Steve Martin and Michael Caine. That's a great movie. That's a training, that's a training flick as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. I mean, it's just filled with elicitation techniques. And if you know what you're looking at, you say, oh, that was really well done. You know, or you can say, oh, 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 that was a funny movie, and then you move on with the rest of your life. <laughs> 
So what, um, you know, I just, I'd like to give like maybe a couple tips about what the uh, person listening that wanted to practice these skills, like you're saying, um, what kind of things could they observe about people? Like you, you mentioned a couple of things, like you said, yeah, someone who's neat and clean. What does that tell you about them? It tells me that that guy is going to have uh, a real desire for accuracy and precision. That he's probably an architect or an engineer or a scientist or something of that character, a banker, uh, and he is probably going to uh, react adversely. Uh, uh, no, not adversely. That suggests something else. Uh, he's liable to react uh, favorably uh, to, from my perspective, with information that I want him to give me uh, if I make a purposely erroneous statement. Okay. So if I see somebody who is by nature neat, if his desk is neat and orderly, uh, the chances are that if I can suspend my own ego long enough to say something that I know is wrong for the specific and express purpose of having somebody else correct me with the accurate information, which is what I'm really after, then I've done my job for no other cost other than a few seconds of humility, which we can all use. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah, it makes if, good sense. If I, yeah. If, on the other hand, I see a guy who has really poor personal habits. Uh, he's got, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, pieces of cheese from his uh, Egg McMuffin this morning still in his beard, and it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, he probably isn't the guy who is into accuracy and precision very much, so I would <laughs> use a different kind of an approach with him. So, uh, is it somebody who has a high need for closure, or somebody who lives in the world of expansive conversation? That doesn't necessarily mean introvert or extrovert. It may mean somebody who lives according to schedules. Uh, it may be somebody who is quick to make a judgment. You know, we're going to capitalize on that. You know, is this right or wrong? Is, it may be the underlying question, but the statement that elicits him making a very rapid judgment is something that's going to tell us some things, particularly when it's someone with whom we will be having multiple interactions. And, you know, very often my observations of people who are on the nefarious side of these kinds of things spend very little time, and that's a, that's a good thing to a certain extent, they spend very little time getting to know the individual and what it is that's going to motivate him or her to provide that piece of information. And then they never bother to write it down. They never bother to call that person back. They never, you know, in, in my world, that's almost a sinful waste of useful information. Uh, when we were doing largely business intelligence consulting work for companies, uh, we had almost a million people in our database so that we knew based on people that we had met at trade shows, conferences, airplanes, trains, buses, ball fields, wherever, what kind of work somebody did, where he worked, what his position title was, what information he could likely have access to, so that then if we got an assignment to find out things marketing-related in the telecommunications industry, we'd punch in those values into the database and up would spring 55 people, and those 55 people would have... Uh, uh, handling tips next to their uh, next to their entry you know the guy is shy and retiring the guy is loud and boisterous the guy drinks too much he likes small fur animals uh, whatever it is because at the end of the day uh, that's an investment that we made in getting to know who that guy was in the first place and we really should uh, have uh, some way of capitalizing on that investment I don't mean monetizing it but uh, but uh, being able to reach back out to that person at another time. And if I happen to get hit by a beer truck, all that stuff goes away if I've been keeping it in my head, whereas if I put it into a database, it becomes much more useful. Um, fortunately, most of the hacker kind of people are um, looking at things on a one-off basis, and they don't generally do very much of a database build for themselves. They just keep hitting, uh, knowing that at some point they're going to strike gold with somebody. But 
you know, we tend to uh, expect people to be responsive to us immediately. This is a slight variation of what we were just talking about, but I think it's useful. Um, you know, we're motivated to do things, and when you seek out to find what my motivations are, you can't ask me what my motivation to participate in a survey are. First thing, you, if you can determine what my values and my beliefs are, my motivations are going to be pretty easily observable at that point. Does that make sense? It does. And, and how does the everyday person know, like just a lay person that may be listening to this and want to try their hand at it? You know, there is no target. There is no goal. You know, they're not doing this for a living. They're just like, yeah, I want to see if I can do this. How, how do they get started? How do they practice this every day? I would think that you, first off, have to decide what is the outcome. Most of us, again, as I alluded to earlier, are not very outcome-oriented. That is to say, we don't look at somebody and say, I want to get this piece of information from him or her. When we uh, encourage people to go out and practice these things, we give them very specific assignments. And we say, we want you to find the PIN number that this person uses to gain access to their cell phone or to their bank account, or something of that character. And they almost inevitably think that it's uh, going to be terribly difficult. And the more introverted the person, the more difficult they think it will be. Uh, our experience, however, is that the more introverted the person, the better listener they are. And the Lord gave us two ears and one mouth, and we're supposed to use them proportionately, and most extroverts tend to forget that, and they tend to dominate a conversation. And they wind up not being as efficient as an introvert. So if you've got somebody who is mildly introverted, I would say that that's an attribute rather than a, uh, a, a negative in this interaction. Second point is that once they've, uh, they've established what that uh, outcome is, then say, what are the likely techniques that I have mastered or that I'm basically familiar with, and which ones am I going to practice today? So if I go into a car dealership, you're under no obligation to buy a car or anything else, and that guy is in, under absolute obligation to tell you everything you can possibly want to know. So here's an opportunity for you to practice in a completely benign environment, just as long as you leave your checkbook at home, right? Because uh, you may not go in there with the intention of buying a car, and the guy could be really good. <laughs> uh, but suffice it to say that you have hundreds of interactions every day that are potential practice activities. So that the more you see people, I mean, you can practice on your wife if you're stupid, uh, because, of course, you'll have a terrible payback when she catches you. Uh, but you see teachers all day, you see automobile mechanics. I mean, there are uh, as many various types of people that give you opportunities to practice. You know, you might say, I'm going to try and just offer something about myself with a reasonable expectation that the other person is going to say something back to me about themselves. And then gradually move the conversation along, changing techniques, saying, you know, I'm going to use uh, a provocative statement to get his attention, to get him to ask me a question, and then I'm going to respond and then get him to respond. I might flatter him a little bit. I might uh, use self-flattery, give him an opportunity to flatter himself rather than me saying, oh, what a great pocket protector, or what a great belt buckle, or what a great car, you know? How has the Internet changed all this? I mean, can you do... Can you do a lot of this online without ever meeting sure. these people, or are you kind of like Absolutely. old school, talk to these people in real life? No, online is sometimes even better. Uh, email exchanges are wonderful, particularly if you're using something on the order of one of the old anonymizers. Uh, you know, getting somebody in a chat room, getting somebody who is on a blog about particular things, they're already engaged and they're already sitting there. Uh, you know, they may not have any conversation with you over the phone or face-to-face, -face, but they'll let their fingers do their talking for hours on end. It's a wonderful uh, expansion of our ability to use these kind of techniques. 
So instead right. of it being something you only can do talking to somebody, no, it's far more than that. And it gives you an opportunity to, uh, to, uh, to plan it even better because you can look back and see what he's already written to help formulate your next, uh, your next approach. To yeah, for us, um, the Internet, at least in this field, has become an invaluable tool because uh, it's not just um, even using elicitation skills. Uh, sadly enough, people post everything about their lives on Facebook or Absolutely. LinkedIn or other social media sites. So it, it, it becomes, I mean, That's elicitation in a sense becomes easier because you don't have to even start a conversation. People are telling you all about themselves. And, um, you know, between matching four or five of the main uh, social media outlets together, if one person has accounts in each one of them, you know, you could, you can, in essence, cyber stalk them with very little effort, knowing where they eat, where they work out, where they live, where Absolutely. they vacation, what they like, what they dislike. You know, you can know all these things before you ever even approach a person. It's great from an elicitor's Absolutely. standpoint, you know, even for us in our industry, that's great. But it's scary also from the extent of a security professional, um, you know, to look at these things and say, this is why, you know, there was just a recent attack uh, on a company called uh, WHMCS. Mm -hmm. They manufacture, or they make, they produce a software package that does uh, billing sure. and invoicing for clients. Um, it's like a, a web-based um, um, accounting package, and they their, their company was completely owned uh, because a, a, a hacker group um, called in and made believe they were the database administrator and said they needed to have the password reset. And when the, when the security question was asked, it was something that he had blogged about or put somewhere on a social media page or something to that effect – and the answer was easy to either guess or find because of how, how easy the question was. And, and they answered the question properly. And, of course, you know, because they did, the security team said, okay, we'll reset it. What do you want your password to be? Password was reset. These guys mm -hmm. logged in, dumped 1.7 gigs of credit cards and client data, and then erased the servers. Absolutely. You know, we're not even – like this is like beyond elicitation now because it's just it's, – it's child's play. Uh, because technology and the internet has made it that way. Um, All right. One of the things that we found to be really useful when dealing with companies that were of that character is that we would uh, invite groups of 50 people in one division and uh, to uh, uh, and and get the permission of one guy uh, who you know really didn't care. You know, we'd already looked him up and found a whole bunch of things about him and said, okay, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we've got Tim sitting over here in the corner. And Tim is all preening and etc. And we say, now, this is the way that we would approach Tim. This is what we would converse with Tim about. These are the kinds of things that we would expect Tim would wind up telling us because we became this trusted uh, confidant online or something of that character. All of these things that are publicly available about Tim, we spent about an hour and a half online, and this is what Tim tells us. You know, after that, that becomes kind of an interesting um, uh, set of events when you see people going in and erasing a lot of stuff off of their sites or off the sites that they frequent, uh, because they'll suddenly get an appreciation of just how much at risk they are. Uh, if I were to really be sending a message to the uh, to to augment the security messages of a company, I would put it in the context of um, of identity theft. Uh, you know how people actually do identity theft based on information that's publicly available, and then talking to somebody in a seemingly innocuous conversation, and then somebody goes out and replicates your persona to this credit card company or that bank or whatever, and then has the, uh, the new credit card sent to their mailing address as opposed to your mailing address, and pretty soon you're $10,000 in debt. Well, that actually happened to, um, to Paul Allen, who's one of the richest people at, oh, on yeah. earth, right? He, that uh, he, uh, An ex-military guy came yeah. back to the States. I guess he deserted, and he made a call to Citibank. And was able to convince the guy at Citibank that he was Paul Allen, and Paul Allen had a new address, and he needed his debit card sent to this new address, and the guy sent out. 
you know, sent sent yep. out the uh, the debit card to him, and he, you know, he was able to obtain this debit card from one of the richest men in the world by just being able to do what you Indeed. just described. So exactly. it's, it's it's unfortunate. And, and when you and when you lay that out and put it onto a person's lifestyle, you know, you can talk about the company, you can talk about protecting company secrets, government secrets. All those kinds of things, forever. And people will go, oh, yeah, okay, well, that'll happen to somebody. But when you put it down on a personal level and you say, as, as we did with one guy, he was a, he was the CEO of a company, uh, we had found some things that, uh, you know, he had actually done wrong. And when we said, and we found this stuff and we got this stuff about your organization from you that you didn't realize that he said, man, I'm really a terrible example. We said, why don't we, uh, why don't we capitalize on this and make you even more of a terrible example? And we used him as an example of identity theft uh, in his own company and showed how we replicated him. And what that did was put everybody in a mode of, well, if they could do it to him, they can certainly do it to me. I'm going to be a lot more cautious now sure. to recognize these things when people use them. Hey, John, now you've been doing this in sort of the commercial space for a long time, but before that you were in special operations and intelligence. Can you give us a, can you tell us like a pretty rad story, I would assume, of using this stuff in Southeast Asia? I mean, you, you've done this in military theaters. How does it differ? Yeah. And also give us something to, uh, give us something to drool over. Well, let me just, let me just speak about the the world that I know most about, and that is, the world of trying to take somebody from uh, being a scientist in a research facility in another country who is working on some technology that my country needs to know a lot about. Okay. He doesn't wake up in the morning thinking about, I hope somebody provides me an opportunity today to commit espionage. People don't, normal people don't wake up, that way any morning, right? When I come to meet this guy at an international conference, for example, and begin to develop a relationship with him, I can't say what my real name is, and I can't say what my real organizational affiliation is, and I certainly can't say what my real purpose is. So when I first go to meet this guy, I can't ask him, what is it about you that I could exploit and motivate you to betray your country for $50 a month on the undying gratitude of the American people? Okay. I can't ask him right. any questions that relate to that, but I need to be able to tease that information out of him over the course of multiple meetings so that at some point down the road, when I know not only what kind of information he has access to, but what kind of motivations he might have, uh, whether they're monetary or uh, hatred or ideological or whatever the case might be, I'm going to be able to set up his buttons. And so I'm looking for his motivational uh, strategies, if you will. What is it that causes him to do something? Okay. This is no different. This is really no different than selling somebody a Corvette at a Chevy dealer. You still need to be able to anticipate what that guy's motivating factors are going to be. They're intimately, as I alluded to earlier in our conversation, tied to his values and his beliefs. And the more that you can establish those things, the more you can understand his motivation for cooperating with you in virtually any domain. If you're a newspaper man, what is it that the guy is going to tell you about the government program he's working on? Uh, if it's in the espionage domain, what is it that he needs to have satisfied? Does he care about international peace? Does he care about the care and feeding of his grandchildren in the nuclear age? Uh, myriad applications of this. And it would seem to me that when you talk about getting things that you drool over, very few things in this world are things to drool over. Most of them are pretty unexceptional. And uh, the things that we tend to think are James Bondish, sexy, and whatnot, really have 
application in almost every aspect of daily life, whether we're pharmacists or lawyers or HR guys or security professionals or uh, sales guys. Does that make sense? Yeah, it seems like a lot of this almost is somewhat inconsequential in the grand scheme, but every it's like if, if you're not doing it at all, you lose. But if you're doing it even full force, it's kind of like, well, we're just treading water anyway. Well, it's it's not so much treading water. You're actually going after a specific and established uh, identifiable outcome, which is to prevail in whatever domain you're um, assigned to prevail in, whether it's espionage or special operations or sales or recruiting uh, IT jocks. Uh, you know, all of these things that we talk about are an infinite um, uh, range of variables because we've got an infinite number of people that we have uh, reasons to interact with. And that's just exciting to me. It's not because I love people, it's because I love the process. I guess 300 years ago, I'd have probably been just hanging out in the woods hunting. But this <laughs> is hunting of that character. Uh-huh. So how much information actually gets transferred between, you know, you're trying to keep information secret as well, and we don't have really the ability and time here to get into that, but you're trying to keep information as well So by d spreading disinformation. So, I mean, I guess how much information gets transferred back and forth between these, these various parties that is actually useful? Ah, uh, great question. Uh, I think that there's kind of a rule of thumb in the deception business that about three to five percent of the information that you're actually um, uh, sending to somebody is deceptive, but it's so much more important. You know, the real thing that you want to get into the intended recipient's mind is really grossly overwhelmed by the amount of relatively immaterial information that you're wrapping around it in order to get that one nugget into that decision maker's mind and he believes that that piece of deceptive information is true because all the rest of what you've told him is true. Oh, I see. I see. So you have to kind of, you got to kind of be sneaky about it. It's kind of like when you're a kid and you ask your parents like, Hey, can I go uh, to Jim's house and then stay overnight and then stay out really late past my bedtime and then come back in the morning in time for school? And they're like, sure. Wait, what? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, can I go over to Jim's house and study? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Now, John, I guess... Um yeah, we're we're approaching an hour, so I wanted to I wanted to ask you just a couple of quick questions. You know, we we have this great deal we worked out with with your with your buddy who's uh, republishing this book. Um, why is the book not in print anymore? Before this, well, it has been in print. It's been in print almost continuously since 1999. It first came out in uh, in 1999 uh, through Harper Collins. And then in, uh, in about 2002 was when it went into the uh, paperback edition. But the real reason behind the book was to, uh, to assist the business activities of Phoenix Consulting Group, which did two things. It provided intelligence training and solutions to companies, that is, consulting work to companies, and we were doing it like any other consultant, whether it's McKinsey or whomever. You know, you, you gain credibility as a consultant by writing books. So that was the purpose of the book. The second uh, business area was serving the needs of the federal intelligence and special operations communities, which, as you may have heard, uh, during the latter part of the year 2001, things changed dramatically uh, in those domains. And so, really, we did we ultimately sold off the business intelligence portion of it in the mid 2000s uh and concentrated singularly on the uh, on the government side well what's interesting is like when you go to amazon and you look you look for yeah. your book uh i think there's like two yeah. out there one is a hardcover that's $500 yeah. <laughs> right. and you know well, it's just that blew me away you know yeah. and then and then right. there's um there's a couple used copies 
that that are out right. there that are um, you know maybe like fifty to seventy five dollars a piece, but uh, it's it's all, right. it's really hard for me to find a, a new one anywhere. Well, we had had uh, people who were anxiously engaged in getting as much. Uh, working through Amazon and those others as possible. And then our business focus in the company changed, so we didn't have people doing the maintenance of the relationship with Amazon, and so it just ultimately petered out because we were doing so much uh, selling those things along with many other things to the uh, to the federal communities. And that's where, uh, that's where Tony, of course, uh, uh, encountered us and said, hey, can we get a bunch of these? And I said, oh, yeah, sure. You know, there, how many more do you need? And he said, "Oh, well, goodness!" So that's how the uh, that's how we've come kind of full circle back into the non-federal uh, side of the sales of the books, and it's uh, it's been very surprising to me the uh, the amount of interest there is. And so I guess uh, the way that uh, it's being set up now, I, I guess that the Amazon thing uh, is being rejuvenated. But frankly, you know, I'm I'm now at one of those old retired fat guy things. And so I don't pay much attention to it anymore. Well, I tell you what we're excited about is uh, we worked a deal out with with Tony and your your guys who are printing the book, and we're going to have it for sale on social engineer dot dot com uh, for for a limited oh, cool. time before yeah. it gets anywhere like on Amazon or anywhere else. Um, and and there is a lot of interest in it because I mean this you know this topic is. I think it is is gaining an interest, even though it you know like when you read the book and you read the, you know the information that you have put like on the back cover or in the inside, it seems like something that would be just for government guys or guys who were in the security industry, but elicitation ta- techniques can enhance your ability to just converse and communicate on a daily level. So this this kind of information could be really beneficial for anyone who who's interested in in um, just having better conversations. Sure. Uh, I, I'm, and some people like to have structured conversations, and they don't know how to structure them. This provides a framework for that. Yeah, really excellent. Uh, if people want to know more about you, what, where can they go somewhere on the, <coughs> excuse me, on the web to, to get some more information on, on what you're doing now? Um, actually, what I'm doing now is uh, I'm involved in a variety of philanthropic activities. Uh, we've started some foundations that uh, that assist primarily uh, uh, women and kids who are in difficult circumstances, uh, single moms who would like to uh, live better lives uh, by getting educations and better housing and things of that character. Uh, that's a, kind of a niche where a lot of people fall through the cracks. Uh, or else they become uh, dependents of the state. And uh, we're looking to help people develop more dignity and uh, less dependence, uh, more independence, if you will, uh, through education and uh, living a better and, uh, life. What's the name of, uh, can you tell us what's the name of that uh, foundation that you're on? Yeah, the, the foundation is called the ELM Foundation, as in E-L-M for Expect Little Miracles. We're not a big government agency, uh, and we've got a bunch of uh, companies that we've started that are all for-profit companies, and all the profits go into the ELM Foundation to uh, to continue this, uh, this yeah, Is there a website that we can promote for you on the ELM Foundation? No, actually, uh, we try and do it as quietly as possible. We have a network of people who suggest potential recipients. Wow, what a wonderful work that is. Thank you for doing that. Well, it's uh, you know it's part of the stewardship that we're all given. At the end of the day, uh, we're uh, we're given opportunities for personal growth and excellence, and we can either go buy yachts uh, or not. Definitely appreciate you guys uh, sharing the the book with us. We're really looking forward to seeing how that how how people uh, respond to that offer. So um, I'm sure we'll be talking again in the future, and, and just want to thank you again. Well, I I hope that you're. That you're going to be selling the book for more than a dollar ninety-five. Yes. <laughs> yes, definitely, definitely for more than a dollar ninety-five. <laughs> I thank you very much, gentlemen, for the uh, for the opportunity to talk this afternoon. Uh, as I said, I've been uh, into this uh, kind of retirement mode. <laughs> well, thank you for um, thank you for everything today, and uh, we'll talk soon. Have a great afternoon. Take care, gentlemen. Bye bye. Bye. All righty. Bye. As Dave had to Dave had to head off. Ping abandoned us, so it's just you and me, man. That's right. You know? That's right. It's a cool that, kids club. That's now. right. That's right. We got rid of all the dead weight, and now we can actually have a real podcast. 
Yeah. Yeah, you hear that, guys? Exactly. That's right. Well, you know, no, th- these these insults will fall on dead ears because uh, – deaf ears, I should say, because Dave never listens to our podcast, you know. True. Yeah, yeah. that's and, true. And Ping's probably too busy traveling the globe, so she won't even hear any of this. That's it. Yeah, that's I have I have a theory what happened to her, but I won't share because it's not safe for work. <laughs> so. Thank you. I appreciate <laughs> yeah. that. You can share no that problem. on your podcast. <laughs> uh, exactly. Exactly. Pickupodcast.com. So, yeah, we can definitely. <laughs> wow, shameless plug. Shameless a, plug. That's a little NLP right there. <laughs> Nobody even heard it consciously. <laughs> oh, man. Hey, John, John was a good. I tell you, when you start reading this book, uh, and I know that people are going to be like wanting to get a copy in their hands. It's a re- yeah, he's got some really interesting stuff in this book. And, um,. What I liked about it is uh, the the principles that are here. I mean, of course, he's talking mainly about his work when he was in the in the government and the military. Um, but how much a lot of this overlaps um, what I do and also what you do. I know, yeah, but, totally. Which is kind of scary. You think about it, like the same principles that they're using, like he said, to go convince a guy to betray his country for fifty bucks a month and you know a, a thank you from the president is the same stuff that you use. To teach guys how to pick up tricks and the same stuff I used to do, like a SE pen test. Yeah, I mean, it's it is really interesting. When I was reading the book in the beginning, there was a lot of, well, you know, first we want to start off doing this and you know, innocent topics, and then we don't want to ask direct questions because it puts people on the defensive and it, it doesn't and it sort of stifles conversation. I'm like, this is exactly what we're teaching, I mean, you know, not, not entirely, but it's a lot of this has a, a lot of overlap to what we're teaching at the Art of Charm when it comes to, you know, how to, for example, get women to start talking about their lives and make you think that, that you're interesting, you know, because people, it's just like that you just get them on a roll and it's like, wow, I could be a spy, but instead <laughs> I'm using each guy. That's, how that's great. <laughs> I tell you, one of the best parts of the book for me, at least, I guess, because of what, <clears throat> because of my field, is the um, one of the appendices in the back that talks about the um, seven laws of deception, and and I'm not going to go into it because I'm going to let I'm just going to tease people so they have to buy the book to read it, but I thought this is a really really cool section in the back of the book because um, and it, he gives re- really interesting stories uh, about things that he's done. Uh, that back up these rules uh, about deception and how how people can uh, could pick these apart and then use them, notif- you know, notice them and be protected from them. I, I really enjoy this book. It's really a it's going to be one that sits not on the uh, back shelf but sits on my desk, as I'll probably be using it often through my through my work. Yeah, no, I, I dig it. I, I want to throw some stuff in from here into the AOC curriculum, um, and I'm definitely going to be trying some of this stuff. Uh, in my daily life too, because I, I already do a lot of this naturally, which is great. Um, I like I like that, you know. Uh, that it's always good to have sort of that confirmation that you know how to elicit info. I guess maybe not everyone takes that as a compliment. I think that's cool, and I really like some of it. You know, whenever whenever somebody finds something that you're doing and can confirm it in a very structural way. For example, when we teach our boot camps here at AOC, we will talk about, oh, well, you know, this is a signal of interest from a girl, and here's how you generate more of those, and here's positive body language, and here's why you interpret certain nonverbal communication the way you do. A lot of people will, and that's, you know, maybe 10% of it or 20%, but a lot of people go, oh, I've noticed that throughout my whole life, but I've never Uh thought about it in a codified way. This book has a lot of that, where it's like, well, you know, people will want to correct an erroneous statement. And in the beginning of the show, I was just messing around mostly, but I was like, so all your clients are psychologists? And he's like, no, 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 we do this and that. And I was like, ha, I got you. Yeah. I got you with your own <laughs> material. Well, what's, what's, what I liked about it is that like these elicitation tactics, they're, it, they're based on human psychology. So it, it's not like it's all malicious stuff, but it works. You know, I mean, you notice I really wanted him to teach us some skills. So, you know, like you use that tactic. I used ego suspension. In the beginning, you know, throwing out uh, a, a bad scenario and then having him correct me and go through the scenario and actually teach us how to make it better. Because I see, I'm using my own personal life experience. You know, when I first started in these skills, that's probably the way I would have done it and not used any of these great tactics. So I could see many people saying, well, how, how do you even start a conversation to get information from someone without asking a question? It doesn't seem possible. 
Um, so walking through a scenario like that, we got to use some of his tactics to ha- to have him teach us how to how to use them. So that's yeah. It was it, what was really cool and what speaks for itself in this book is that we ran the, a large part of this interview using his tactics on him, and he responded. Granted, he's not trying to keep secrets from us. It is an interview, so we we'll, won't pat ourselves on the back too strongly. <laughs> but, you know, it was cool because it was just like it worked, and he didn't go, aha, you're using my own technique. Right. I mean, he was just like, oh, yeah, anyway, blah, 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 blah. I mean, it's just that if, if you do this stuff well enough, it flies under the radar because a lot of people will read this and go, oh, if somebody did that to me, I would totally know. No, you wouldn't. Right. The guy who wrote didn't even notice exactly, and 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 the great part is is that because it wasn't malicious, and the you know like you said, we weren't trying to steal any major secrets from him. It, this it shows that you can use these skills in just normal everyday conversation. Exactly, you know, and and we were able to have a, a good interview with a guy who wrote the book on this stuff, uh, just by using this. So you know, it's not all when I want to get the password from the you know database administrator, or when I want to pick up this chick, or when I want to do this or that. Just normal everyday. I'm having a conversation with this guy. I'm going to talk about these things, and bam, you can use these skills to do that. I think it's I think it's great. Yeah, no, I liked it, and I liked the book. I'm, I wish I had uh, read the entire thing. I got it like you know the day before the yeah, show. Yeah, I know. I know. Well, you know, but, this uh, is a real special thing for us. I mean, the guy who he, who's been his buddy forever contacted him, and you know, like like he was saying, everyone in the government they have their special little printing for that, but the public eye, this book's not printed anymore. So this guy says, let's print some, and it just so coincided with with me getting in touch with him and talking about getting John on the podcast, and then, you know, just the way the deal worked out, um, his his buddy uh, made, a, made a great offer for us that we could put it on our site, and he won't sell it anywhere else. You know, he won't put it on Amazon, he won't put it on the other book sites, he'll give us like a few months of time where we, we'll be like the sole provider for this book anywhere on the web. So I'm really excited about that because I think this is one of those books that's going to be like a collector's item. You know, they're obviously not going to be able to reprint it forever. So it'll be like a collector's item. And these these principles don't – it's not like technology where a year from now they'll be like, oh, yeah, you know, that, that elicitation technique is old news. It's like No, <laughs> this is all stuff – I mean in the beginning of the book he says – He's, he gives, like, biblical examples of this stuff being used in Jericho with Moses and Joshua. Yeah, yeah. And you're like, oh. And he goes, this is important because it's the first use of a safe house, elicitation techniques, you know, secret. And he's, a lot of the quotes in the chapters are from Sun Tzu, and they're not that abstract, like, vague reference where it's like, well, Sun Tzu said, know thyself and know thy enemy. <laughs> no, it's like, he's like, secret spies operating behind enemy lines are the most valuable asset for the general. Like, there, you can't, you're not reading between right. the lines on anything. <laughs> you know? I know. Oh, great, great stuff, man. It, it is. It's cool. So this is one of those books where it's like, okay, I like this stuff. This is really neat. It's really applicable. It's really practical. And also, now we're sitting here with a copy of the same book that every spy gets, which is pretty awesome. Yeah, that is kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe we shouldn't sell well, them. Maybe we should just keep them for ourselves and... And then, like, when everyone on the podcast that's listening wants one, we charge them, like, $500. Yeah, you know you know who we could sell them to and make a lot of money is China. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Right now, there's a knock on my door, and it's like the CIA, and they're coming to arrest me. Thanks, Jordan. Yeah, I wouldn't sell it to China. North Korea, on the other hand, would pay a pretty high. <laughs> Great. Okay, um, anyone who's listening... They don't have internet, so... China has ebooks versions of this. In North Korea, they need paperback. <laughs> anyone who's listening to this from the government, I, I did not offer that. But Jordan I mean, Harbinger. You, yeah, you're just the one selling it online. I have one copy. How many copies do you have? <laughs> Jordan <actually>? Harbinger <laughs> is going to sell this to Korea and China. <laughs> I'll send you his address. Just email me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because you have that. <laughs> yeah, actually. Oh, you do, I do. actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Foil, you elicited that. That's you? right. I elicited that by offering you a gift. You see, quid pro quo. <laughs> that's, I got help. that's awesome. Okay, so let's see. What else do we got going on? Uh, you talked about your, you talked about your classes, which are like completely sold out, which is ridiculous. Yeah, it's the middle of July. We have like one seat, and then we have a couple seats in August, and then we're looking at fall for live programs. Ridiculous. That's quite awesome. Um, same here. Our class is completely booked for Vegas, uh, cool. which is July, and then uh, we had to move our UK class. Oh boy, I tell you, I really, 
you know, I didn't. I, this was my fault completely, so I'm taking all the blame for this. But I didn't look into what's happening around that time, and, and the Olympics is in London oh, in August, gosh. right? So I was going to be going to August. Um, at the end of August, going to, to the UK, and it, everyone that was signing up was like, you know how expensive tickets are? Do you know how hard it's going to be getting in and out of London? And I'm like, what's going on at Olympics? So, duh. So Yeah, nice nice move, yeah. man. Yeah. Why is this conference room $10,000 yeah, an hour? Exactly. What is going on? <laughs> an hour, yeah. Yeah, I don't know why it's costing me so much to run this class, man. I, I don't get it. So we uh, we moved it to November, um, which seems to be working a lot better for everyone who's already signed up. And there's a lot of more interest now in attending that, so I suspect we'll be sold out of that one. And then we have our first class for 2013 already scheduled, which is in March, um, at the MySec guys over in Detroit, oh, Michigan. That's my hometown. Really? Ah, oh, cool. Okay, so MySec is a group, a security group, you know, that get together and they're helping promote. Uh, the class out of Detroit, and um, they're they're going to bring us in, Robin and I, to do that class there. So, if you want any information on that, or you want to sign up for that, you got to check it out on social engineer dot com, and you can get some uh, more info and reg for that class before it fills. Because I'm sure we're limiting all of our. I don't know how you do it, Jordan, but we limit all of our classes to particular sizes. Like I like to not do over twenty, max twenty two, oh, yeah. because then it gets too big, and you can't really give personal. Um, help to, to any of the I people. agree. Yeah, we, we cap ours at six because we need to be able to get it. We have 60 hours, and we figure Ooh. 10 hours per guy during that week has to be dedicated. And we have one coach for every student or, or at the most for every two because we want to make sure we got to get inside your head and mess around in there. Wow. Yeah. Now that's really interesting, though. Not not a bad concept. I like, I like the way you do that. Maybe down the road there would be something to try. You know, in this field, yeah. like, have it so each – each person that comes to the glass gets a personal coach. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Cool concept. But yeah, I think keeping them small. I mean, there's some people in our, and I don't know about your industry, but our industry, they try to pack like a hundred people in a room and, uh, you know, that works for some topics, but you know, for our topic, we like, we like the people to feel that when they left, they got a lot of personal time with the instructors and they were able to openly ask questions and not feel like there's so many people that they never got to talk or anything, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's that's the thing. We have to make it comfortable for everybody to share. Yeah, and like really get deep. And they're not going to do that if there's like twenty dudes in the back of the room and they don't even know their names yeah. and stuff. You're not going to be like, well, I got divorced and it screwed me up this way, or my parents weren't around. You know, like you don't want to say that in a room full of strangers. You want to say that in front of people that you know really well that are also doing the same thing. Yeah, I so, agree. You know, we have a, we have that. And I guess you could teach. You know, twenty five or fifty five or whatever people. If you're just showing them how to use Microsoft Outlook or something, yeah, that, that's fine. Yeah, probably. You know? Yeah, if it, if it was just a tool based, uh, easy stuff, then I guess those numbers kind of work. But when anytime like yeah. you and like what we're doing, dealing with the, the, the psychological stuff, you need to really get integrated with the with the people in the class. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So we got that going on. Of course, the CTFs. I mean, that's already a done deal, so we can't have any more signups for that. The SECTF for kids, though, there's still signups available there. Uh, right. Dave had, send your kids to, to Chris. Yeah, yeah, that's it. You know, send, <laughs> that's terrible sounding. Bring your kids to DEF CON. Don't send your kids to me. Bring your kids to DEF CON with you as a supervisory adult who will be hanging with them and enjoying the wonderful events of hacking, lock picking, cipher cracking, puzzle solving, and micro expression reading. Did you teach kids how to pick locks? Yeah, it's wonderful. That's really cool. Yeah. I, I feel like I picked a lock once as a teenager, and it took me like three hours. Yeah, so these kids, like we give them little lock pick sets, and then part of the task is they got to go to the lock pick village, and there's this guy who his uh, nickname is Deviant. He's um, like a master lock picker. He runs a village where there's all these locks set up and different things, and people are, are in the room, and they have to um, – you know, you could just stay. You could stay there all day. You could practice lock picking. You know, in the room, they don't care. So they work with us on the CTF for kids, and we send the kids in there, and they gotta, they get. You know, well, I'm not gonna give away all those secrets, but they get a different, certain difficulty lock, and they gotta play with it for as long as they they need to to pick it. Of course, they can try to use social engineering tactics to elicit help from complete strangers, but however they do it, they gotta get that lock picked before they get the next clue. <laughs> Some kids like. Hey, quick, my mom's trapped in the trunk of the car. I need to borrow your bolt cutters, yeah. mister. All right. 
van. <laughs> My mom's trapped in the truck. <laughs> <laughs> Don't give the kids ideas, Jordan. I mean, seriously. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so and, and no fireman's like, oh, I'll go and help. Nah, you you take the bowl cutters. I'll be here at Starbucks. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I don't think it's that severe, but you know they they try they try. And last year, uh, all the kids uh, we had a couple kids, uh, I think like eight, nine, ten years old, real young, and they weren't getting it, but they were not giving up. I mean, this one girl, I think she said she spent uh, forty five minutes on this lock, just messing with it before she got it, and uh, she was not giving up. You know, there was just no no chance that she was going to talk someone into doing it, or. Or go, you know, trying to cheap out of it somehow. So she stuck it out. So I mean, it teaches the kids. I mean, some people get upset, like, "Oh, you're teaching kids criminal skills." And you know what? I I had to. We locked our keys in a car once. I didn't have my pick set or anything with me. We had a locksmith come out. This dude makes two hundred bucks for five minutes of work. Yeah. Two hundred bucks bad. for five minutes. I mean, you want to tell me that knowing how to pick locks is only a criminal skill? I mean, you know, you you you're a locksmith in a in a busy city. I'm sure you could be raking in thousands a day off of helping people get in their homes and their cars and other stuff they lock themselves out of. So yeah, a, unfortunately, most of the time you just make keys for people. But yeah, still, still, I mean, you know, if you got your van, you got all your tools. It could be a, it could be a definite job for somebody. And I know in this industry, red teaming is becoming a lot more. Uh, popular, you know, companies are hiring uh, red teams to see if they can infiltrate their perimeter in a physical way, and a lot of the skills that these guys need to have are involve lock picking. So, it's uh, that would be a cool job, a red team dude, like like a uh, like Red Cell from Dick Marcinko. Remember that book? Yeah, yeah. It, it's, uh, that? There's a lot of guys who are doing that now. I've done a couple gigs like that. You know, people hire you to to try to break into their their facility or or you know. St- yeah, you know, they say like there's an office that holds all the stuff. We want to see if you know how easy it is for you to get past security, get in there and steal the plans. Maybe we should offer that at AOC. We'll red team. We'll red team <laughs> your girlfriend. <laughs> I, okay, no, no, no. Go in the wrong direction. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, maybe it's the right direction. You want to see if she's loyal? Send one of my guys after. Yeah, that. great, great. So now you're red team. Go. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I'm not going along with that business plan. <laughs> uh, so uh, if you if you want to check those things out, also social-engineer.org is where you can sign your kids up for the SECTF. Also keep aware of uh, what's going on with the um, the main uh, social engineering capture the flag. We'll help, we'll be listing updates there and and other things like that. Um, of course, we tweet all this stuff. So if you want to follow us on Twitter, it's uh, Human Hacker. And on IRC, we're on the irc.freenode.net network on channel Social Dash Engineer. If you like the um, if you like the outro music, you got to check out Dual Core. That guy rocks. DualCoreMusic.com. He's got all of his albums up there and some free music that he made for us, so you can check those things out there. Vegas, baby, gonna be up five hundred by midnight. Oh man, Vegas, it's just gonna be nuts. I mean, I cannot believe that it's next month. That we're going to be at Black Hat and DEF CON. I just still am not. I'm in a little bit of disbelief right now. I am too. We're going to eat a lot of food, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, That's why I'm happy. Sure. <laughs> we'll talk to you guys next month. Thanks for checking us out. See you. Smile, disarms. Everything's good. No cause for alarm. Because I'm like you. And likewise the same. But for you, this is work. And for me, it's a game. Give a thumbs up if you know what I'm saying. Next round starting. Believe that I'm... Uh, no signal, my battery is finished Hey, could I go and use your phone for a minute? Thanks, yo, I had to make a call to play it down While my root kit X build your data to the cloud Plan to stall, stand apart, gotta take my time Scanning all your systems, the ones you didn't wipe Scamming y'all, I got terabytes of drives Cannonball, in the dumpster when I dive Black and white, all the info with the details And what type of person really prints out emails Still intact, all the sentences and questions I mean, paper shredders really aren't that expensive Yup, we want it all, the kit and caboodle It's not that impressive, I just know how to Google Found the CEO with the social network name Sir, nope, it's dual core, we're just leveraging the framework Welcome one and all to this fun competition Except nobody knows if there's any opposition Face so friendly, smile disarms Everything's good, no cause for alarm Cause I'm like you, and likewise the same, but for you this is work, and for me it's a game.
give a thumbs up if you know what I'm saying. Next round starting, believe that I'm playing. Welcome one and all to this fun competition. Except nobody knows if there's any opposition. Face so friendly, smile disarms. Everything's good, no cause for alarm. Cause I'm like you, and likewise the same. But for you, this is working. For me, it's a game. Give a thumbs up if you know what I'm saying. If you know, if you, if you know what I'm saying. Competition, except nobody knows if there's any opposition. Face so friendly, smile disarms, everything's good. No cause for alarm, cause I'm like you, and likewise the same. But for you, this is working, for me, it's a game. Give a thumbs up if you know what I'm saying. Next round starting, believe that I'm playing. Thumbs up if you know 